Hey, so today we are going live and I will be doing an interview where I'll be interviewing my friend Eric Bergman. Uh, so for this, for, for me, this is going to be very surreal because I haven't done one of these live interviews for a long time now. Uh, here he is, my friend Eric. So I'm going to invite him in and I'm going to get him to share a bit about his journey because he's got an incredible story and he's such an inspiration, this guy. Um, he made a lot of money by selling his old company and now he plans to give that money away to help, help make the world such a better place. So tune in, listen in, and I'm going to invite him up now, people. Here he comes. Eric. Hello, Mr. Ryan. How are you? Hello, my friend. How are you? I'm very good. And I realized that I have a very Swedish background here with a red <laughs> little house with white stuff. It looks super Swedish. I'm in, yeah, this is Sweden. So how long have you been in Sweden for? Because I know you, as, um, you, you also live um, in Malta as well, Eric. So how long have you been in Sweden? Yeah, so I lived in Malta for 10 years, but I moved back to Sweden a year and a half ago, something like that. Christmas, yeah, almost two years ago. Uh, and is that... so it's really nice to be here. And how's, how's things with the family, Eric? Hey, they're really good. Tom, my little baby, he's now a year and a half. He started preschool this last week. So that's been uh, quite an experience to have a one-year-old leaving the house. Um, it's good. It's good. Things are good. And I just noticed you sent me a picture before we come on. I see your arm. What's happened? Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I broke my thumb. So I was in a cask. I have this white cask all over. And uh, now I got this for another few weeks but now i can move it again but yes yeah, <laughs> let's say he was stronger than me that's the short story <laughs> so what, what did you learn from that experience there uh, with the uh hands <laughs> uh, but not and not anything really <laughs> 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 I, i'm pretty like it, it hurts to do martial arts but it's also fun and it's just a part of the game <laughs> i didn't really learn anything Okay, <laughs> well, I'm sure there'll be something that you'll think of in the, in the future. But Eric, thank you so much for coming on, my friend. I really do appreciate you. And for anyone that's tuned in now, this is just literally a spur of the moment thing. Uh, me and Eric have been planning this for a short while now, but he's had his uh, commitments with his family, his, his young boy. I've been traveling around through Central America, so it's, it's never come to connect. But he just sent me a message a moment ago. I've just checked into a hotel and it seemed to work perfectly. So let's, let's rock and roll, people, and listen in, tune in, because I know Eric's got an amazing story, which a lot of people can take a lot of wisdom away from this. So, Eric, my friend, thank you for coming on and thank you for being an inspiration for me um, since we met back at, I think, the end of 2019. Uh, we managed to connect and I've done some work for you guys with great.com. Um, it's such a privilege. So could you... Start by Eric, telling us a little bit about yourself, uh, what you do, what you've done, and maybe talk to us a little bit about great.com also. Sure, it's a broad question. I'll, uh, I'll start in like high school. I was 16 and I fell in love with online poker and I got really good at playing, playing poker. So I won a lot of money playing poker and realized that, hey, I can use this money to impress people. So when I was like, 18, I was living high life, buying a lot of champagne, expensive clothes, doing all the things that you dream of doing. Um, and then I stopped winning at poker, which meant that I pretty quickly got flat broke and needed to move back in with my parents because I couldn't afford the lifestyle I already had, um, which was a valuable early on lesson. But it uh, took me partly into the gambling industry and partly into understanding that money comes and money goes. Uh, and I got back into poker, but instead of playing myself, we built a poker playing robot. So we had a robot playing poker 24 seven for playing. Yeah, that was like the first real business was a robot playing 24 seven. It was a fun ride. Uh, and from that on, I led into doing marketing within the gambling industry, built a company named Katina Media, which some years later, was taken to the stock market on a $200 million valuation, uh, which was an exciting journey. But it's, I almost killed myself doing so. I almost killed my business partner because we pushed ourselves way too hard. And at the end of it, 
we didn't get as happy as I thought money would would make us. Um, so yeah, then I started great.com, which is basically the same business model, like trying to build a huge gambling marketing company, but giving everything away to charity. Uh, so it's a, it's a big twist on it, but yeah, that's, it's a vague story in many jumps to try and answer that broad question. <laughs> wow. No, thank you for going over that there, Eric, and sharing that with us. Um, so yeah, I've heard your story a few times now, especially from your younger days when you was growing up. Um, and sort of your entrepreneurial mindset. So I remember you told me a story once, Eric, about some of your younger um, journeys and some of the business ideas that you set up as a child. So could you tell us some about those? And I remember you told me one story about the nightclub that you uh, set up once. Yeah, sure. So let's. So this is. I'm. Uh, I'm 18 years old, and this was probably. Yeah, probably at the time that I had to move back with my parents because I, I spent all my money on champagne and clothes and stuff and I didn't win anything in poker anymore. And I tried to become a nightclub owner or party king or whatever. And I I invited everyone that I knew to this like big event. I rented this nightclub and yeah, put all my blood, sweat and tears uh, into it. And it was a really scary thing to do. Like, it's really scary to invite people uh, to a party. I, I felt I went way out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I was 19 years old. I was 19 years old. And the night of this, this party came and I was just, all these people had told me they were going to show up. And I was so excited. And I was in the door waiting for people to show up. And some people came to this party and I like crossed their name off the list. They walked in. They walked around and after a while they came back out and they left. And then some more friends came and they did the same thing. Like I crossed them off the list. They walked in, they walked around for a little bit, stayed in there and, and they left. And it happened again and again. And like no one actually stayed. And I just remember like a couple of hours in knowing like, okay, this is a, it's a complete uh, disaster it's gonna be horrible and I just felt uh, the humiliation inside of me but also like the 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 grief and the sadness of seeing my friends kind of not supporting me in this challenge like I saw the people I expected like be there and stay there and make sure that people had a good time I remember just seeing those people leaving and walking away and seeing their their backs. It was just a horribly painful experience. And I remember feeling so, so humiliated going back to school after that and like being super worried of what people were going to going to say about it. Cause that's, it wasn't a Friday and I didn't talk to anyone for Saturday or Sunday. And then I came back to school on, on Monday and just waited for people to like laugh and, and point. And I was so surprised because no one said anything. No one did anything. And like people were so busy going on with their own lives and their own days that they had completely forgotten about the party that failed. And it was like a big learning experience. First, it was a big relief. Like I thought people would be just making shitload of fun of me. Uh, and I was like, yeah, no one really cared. Like we're so caught up in our own minds and with our own businesses and our own thoughts and love issues and whatever is going on uh, that no one really cared. And I brought that lesson with me because I do a lot of weird stuff. I've always done a lot of weird stuff and still... Like whenever I do something that puts me way out of my comfort zone and I realize, hey, I can fuck up this badly. Remember that most people don't really think much about me. It's so easy to think. Like we walk around in our lives and we think of ourselves as this role, like the main character in a movie. Like everyone cares about the main character in the movie. It's just the fact that we're never the main character in anyone's movie. Not even our parents' movie, we're the main character. So like, it's so easy to think of ourselves as a main character when in fact we're just some extra that if this was a James Bond movie, we would be killed and no one would think about us. Like that's how it would happen. 
Wow, that's amazing, Eric. And I love the way that you explained it there because when we say put ourselves outside of our comfort zone to try something or to start something new, we almost create this huge problem in our minds where we believe that something's going to go really wrong or someone's going to have something to say about what we're doing. But then like you mentioned there, that everybody is so interested in themselves, they don't have the time to actually look or worry or care about what you're doing or what you've done. And in all honesty, that's the way it should be. Like We should always put ourselves first and what we're doing, whether it's in life, business, work, relationships, we should always put ourselves first because we are our number one priority and nobody cares about your life as much as you do. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's funny to say that you had all this stuff going on in your mind, like, oh, it's, it's a big failure, like, I'm going to go in and people are going to have so much to say about me. But then you found out nobody said anything because they didn't care. They were just worried about themselves. So no one cares. Like, I mean, we are our top. I'm the most important person in my life. I'm also the second and third and fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh, eighth most important. Maybe on position nine, ten, somewhere like there is my fiance and my, my kid. But it's just, that's just the way it is. Like we think of ourselves as being so important to everybody else's life. But at the end of the day, life is mostly a single player game. Like no one knows really what you're thinking or what you're feeling. And you don't know anything about really what someone else is thinking or feeling. So it's just a single player game. And it's important to keep that in mind when we're afraid of taking risks and whatever, because it's like at the end of the day, very few people will care if you succeed or if you fail. Wow, life is a single player game. I love that. And I've never heard of that ever. So it's so true. And what this is making me think of, you know, is like when people say, oh, but I have a child or I have a partner and they're more important than me. Like I need to look after that person. And I always say like, if you're not 100%, say if your glass isn't full, you can't then help others from say a half glass or a half empty glass. And then the way that I compare it to is, say, for instance, when you're on an aeroplane and they say, oh, put your mask on first. But you always need to put your mask on first because if you don't, you may not have the chance or the ability to, to then help others. And so many people have said to me before when I've mentioned this about, oh, but I've got a young child, a young boy or a young girl. They're my priority and I need to make sure they're 100% before I look after myself. But if you think of it that way... If you're not 100%, you can't then help your loved one to the best of your ability. So for anybody that may be thinking that they're not number one priority in their lives, and like you just said, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> if someone's listening to this or watches it back, Eric, and they are not their number one priority, what sort of tip or piece of advice could you give them? I think a good thing is just to to ask yourself how much you think of other people. Like how much time do you spend actually worrying about someone else's mistakes or thinking, oh, that person did something really crappy or whatever. Like it's probably a very small percentage of your day that you think about anyone. And just being aware of how little you think of anyone else compared to how much you think about yourself. And then just flipping that around like, okay, that's how little I think of this or that person. Then that's probably how little that person thinks of me as well. Because just looking at ourselves, we can learn a lot about how other people work. And most of the time we're just worrying about what are people thinking about the clothes I'm wearing? What are people thinking about how my breath smells or what my hair looks like? Like very rarely we spend time thinking about how someone else's clothes look. And if we do, it's not like five second thing like you will never spend like 10 minutes thinking about even if someone has really shitty clothes on you're not going to spend more than five seconds thinking about it so it's, you just look at yourself and see how little you think of other people and once you understand that you realize that that's how little they think of you very interesting i like the way that you uh, put that across so thank you so i want to go back a step eric and mentioned about when you first started to make a lot of money um, doing what you was doing back then. 
Um, and you mentioned about you was buying like the nice clothes and the bottles of champagne and sort of splashing your cash to make yourself look like this big thing to other people. But you wasn't really happy doing that. And then you soon realized as well that that money um, run out rather quick and then you had to move back to your parents. So I want to ask you a few questions. Um, maybe start with, for instance... For any, say, young adult, maybe in their 20s, that's listening to this now, and they're sort of chasing that Insta lifestyle, the, the money, the fame, the, the, the perceived happiness, the, the bottles of champagne, the nice cars, the nice clothes, etc., the holidays to Dubai and Marbs and all this stuff. For anybody that's chasing money to, say, trying to achieve or accomplish this fake or false lifestyle, what sort of few pieces of advice could you give to those individuals? Well, go chase it. I, I don't think that anything I can say will make someone believe that that's not the solution. Like you need to experience that to be able to say that that's not the solution. Uh, so I can say that the answer is not going to be there. You're not going to be happier for having that car or that watch or whatever it is. But I you need to chase it to kind of believe it. Like the entire society, everything in marketing, like every single advert on TV basically says, buy this and you will be happier. It's like the message from everything. Buy this car, you will feel cool, you will be happier. Buy this Coke, you will smile, you will be happier. Buy this shaver, you will look like Brad Pitt, you will be happier. Like everything that is going on and everywhere basically says, buy this and you will be happy. So nothing that I can say will be able to change that, that story inside of, of anyone watching. So I'm not even going to try. Uh, so go chase that dream because once you get there, you, you'll realize that it's not like that. But you'll definitely need to get there before you will believe me. That's, that's the unfortunate truth. Um, but I would also add to that, like, chase money and use as much of it as possible to buy yourself time. Because money is happiness to some extent. Like, money spent on owning your own time is very well spent money. Money spent on buying a Rolex is very not so good spent money. So, like, I firmly believe in making sure that you learn about money and you learn how to make money and definitely find ways of making money when you sleep and make money a priority. Like I believe money is a crucial part to having a good life. It will be very difficult to have a good life unless you have at least a decent revenue stream coming in. But don't waste it on a Rolex before you at least own your own time and can take Tuesday off whenever you want. That's like that's a very useful way of using money when you can take any day off at any time and you're figuring out a way of working because you enjoy it, not because you have to. Yeah, there's such importance in, say, buying back time, um, using money as a tool to buy back that time because time is priceless. Like, it's going to pass by and we're never, ever going to get... So even this conversation that we're having now, we're never going to get this time back to... Time is so much more value than money itself. But so many people say, like, time is money. Well, if time is money, then doing nothing is an expensive hobby because so many people spend their time doing things that are not so good or, or doing nothing, sitting around thinking about that future that they want rather than taking the uncomfortable action to create their, say, dream reality. Um, but, yeah, money is so important. Like Money, I say, magnifies the mission. You need money in order to grow and evolve and create that lifestyle that you want. Um, money solves money problems, right? And there's a quote, I heard it a while back, and it said, it's love that makes the world go round, but it's money that pays for the trip. And Eric, I want to ask you a question about time. I heard you a while back, uh, I think you was on Instagram Live, and I heard you say about the importance of putting a cost or a value on your own time. Like you need to decide how much you're worth per hour and then get rid of the task that doesn't meet the same cost of what it's going to cost you to do it. Could you tell us a little bit about that? If you remember. 
Sure. So this is something that I haven't originated myself. It's come from Naval Ravikant, as this angel investor, philosopher, whatever. And he basically says that no one will pay you more than you value yourself. And you shouldn't do things if you, uh, if it's below what you think that your time is actually worth. And you should give yourself a very high uh, hourly rate, even though no one is willing to, to pay that hourly rate for you. If you want to make money, if you want to become rich, then you need to put your focus on making money and becoming rich rather than uh, saving money by doing everything on, on your own. So his like aspirational salary is like $5,000 an hour, I think. I was, yeah, I think it was $5,000 an hour. So he didn't do anything that costs, like if he would make less than $5,000 for an hour doing so, he wouldn't do anything. So he wouldn't return something he bought online or was broken because it took time. He wouldn't like spend his time doing any kind of chores if he could hire someone to do those chores because he believed that his time should be focused on building a business and like his energy should go into personal growth and so forth. And I think a lot about this uh, in my life. Like I try to avoid everything that doesn't either increases my future ability of earning money or I, like personal growth, like reading and whatever, like things that adds to my future capabilities of making money. That's something that I spend a lot of time on, but I spend very little time on things that can be avoided or like fighting with someone about the cost of something. I just pay for it. I very rarely complain about anything. It's just easier to move on. And just thinking about things like that rather than trying to penny pinch in terms of time. Uh, so that's like the, the general gist of it is Think of yourself as a very rich man before you are a very rich man and spend your time like that uh, and focus on the things that earn money rather than the things that save money in terms of time. Uh, that's like the, the short version of it. But the long version of it is to go and listen to Naval Ravikant's podcast, How to Get Rich. It's on, on YouTube and he has been on Joe Rogan and everywhere else. And he will say it a lot better than I ever will. Thank you so much for explaining it. And again, I loved how you uh, put it across there because if you don't know your own worth in life, somebody else is going to put a price on you and decide your value, you know. Um, so you need to know how much you as an individual are worth per hour, as to say. And then I like what you said about delegating tasks that don't come up to standard with your own worth because... Say, for instance, if you owned your own home and you had a garden, it's going to take you, what, an hour at least to cut the lawn. But you could pay someone, say, $10 to cut the lawn. But if you put a value or a worth on uh, $100 per hour, it makes sense to pay somebody else to do it. And I love what you said as well about arguing or, or penny pinching. And don't get me wrong, I, I love to try and save money where I can. But I found myself before doing it, you know, I've, I've sat there for hours on the phone trying to get somebody to answer my call of, say, something that I'm trying to send back or something that I, I paid for and it didn't go as planned. And I've lost out on, let's say, like 50 bucks, but I spent two hours or three hours on the phone and I'm never going to get that time back. And it drains you and it makes you angry and annoyed. Sometimes it's just better to say, right, cut the loss. I've lost X amount of money and move on and just on to the next. So I love what you said about that, Eric. Thank you so much, my friend. Um, so as we move on now, I just want to just ask you, like, could you talk to us a little bit more, Eric, about some of the things that got you to the position where you are today, whether it's uh, financially or just like your mindset? Because I know you've got such a brilliant mindset, especially with the, the B Becoming Great podcast. So could you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So I think that the, the by far most important thing if you want to reach success is to be a doer. Like, don't try to think too much. Don't try to learn too much. Don't try to read too much. Do things. Because you'll learn a hundred times more by just starting that 
Instagram account and start posting about stuff or start that little lemonade stand or that business or whatever it is that you'll, you'll ever do. So I've, I've always been doing things and most of them have failed, but I don't even realize that they've failed because I've tried something new before it even happened. So I think that's a crucial part is don't find any excuses not to do things. Like so many people want to start this business, but they don't know a developer. So they need a developer to get this app or whatever is going. And then they never start because they don't know a developer rather than, okay, then do something else and get started. Because people are like people who do things attract other people who do things, meaning that you, you find other people who are doers by being a doer. And if you're not a doer, you will simply just not attract those people. Like people who come to me with business ideas and they want to do this and that and they want me to invest and they've never even started it. They just have this PowerPoint. I'm like, go do it and then call me. Like it's, it's like they be someone who does things and you will immediately start attracting other people who does things. And those are the people who makes the world go around. Uh, so I believe that that's the, the first and foremost thing is like, go do things. The second thing is like talk to everyone you meet about the things that you're doing and about your dreams and whatever is going on. Like, I think holding a business idea to yourself is such a shitty idea because people like think, oh, people are gonna steal my idea. They're gonna do this or that. I'm like, no, they're not. Like, people are too lazy. Like, I've spoken about all of my ideas everywhere all the time. No one has ever stolen one of my ideas. I don't, I've never stolen anyone else's idea. I don't think anyone, like I've never spoken to anyone who got their ideas stolen. And still everyone is like holding on to their ideas like they're fucking gold. Ideas are worthless. They're nothing. They're not even air. Like there's nothing. <laughs> so go talk about your ideas. Get people's insight. See what people think of that idea. See if people get inspired of hearing it and wanting to join. Like meet as many people as possible and talk as much about as possible about the things that you want to do and put yourself in in places where there are other people who have ideas and who take action because if you just stick to your loser friends you'll get nowhere but if you put yourself outside of your comfort zone and go in places where people do a lot of stuff you'll get inspired you'll be pulled into things that happen and you have these ideas you talk about them you get more ideas because other people talk about them you get destroyed because people say your ideas suck and it probably does so that's a good thing. It's like do things and talk to a lot of people constantly and that will open up tons of doors. Wow, yeah. I, I love what you said about just trying stuff and putting yourself out there. Um, like I, I believe that the definition of luck, to say, is to put yourself in the centre of discomfort. Like You need to put yourself in the places where other people don't want to go in order to, say, receive the things that others will never receive. Like you have to be willing to do the things that others won't do in order to have the things that others won't have. Because we get so caught up in our little comfort zone and we, we overthink to the point where we procrastinate and we never take action. And I like to say in life there's three types of what I call ATs. You have action thinkers, action talkers and action takers. And you need to take action. You need to just start. Don't think about it too much, like you mentioned, Eric. Just start today. Just go for it. And you've got to navigate along the way because so many people are living life with the traditional ready, aim, fire. But they get caught on the aim part and they never, they never pull the trigger. They never fire. They never take action. So you need to replace that with ready, fire, aim. Prepare yourself. Get ready, obviously. Pull the trigger, yeah. take action, start going, and then you just navigate yourself along the journey as, you, as you're moving because an object in motion usually stays in motion. So just keep going and try a lot of things out. Meet new people. Tell people your ideas, like you say, because if you don't tell anyone what your dreams, desires, and business plans or ideas are, how is anybody going to be able to help you? Like Nobody's going to be able to help you if it's just all in here or in here. So you need to share your ideas with people because that's going to open the opportunities and the doors for the right people that may know someone else and may know somebody else that could introduce you to somebody else and get things rolling, get the ball rolling and get 
things the way you want to go, you know. So I, I really love that. And I've been doing that a lot more recently myself as well, because I've got some really big ideas and plans and visions, but just keeping them inside here, it's going to be very difficult to ever achieve that without anybody else knowing these things. So thank you for sharing that with us there, Eric. Um, so I just want to talk to you about your podcast, because I know you've got the Becoming Great podcast. So can you tell me a little bit about how that started and your plans for the podcast there? Yeah, so the podcast... Now the podcast is mainly a tool for me and Emil to like learn about the things that we really, really care about and spend a lot of time together to try and like communicate. First of all, learn the most important things in life that not many people talk about and then communicate them in a way that it's understandable. So the latest episode that we, we did is three hours long and it's about empathy. And empathy is this huge word that... Very few people could explain what they mean. Um, if you mute your microphone, Ryan, because it's a lot of barking in the background. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, how do I do this? Um, I've never done this before. I little icon over your head with a microphone on it. Thank you so much. <laughs> I didn't realize this. Um, ah, see. There we go. Good job. No, so like we, we, the last episode is about empathy. And empathy is this big word that very few people really know what it means. And I believe it's the most important, maybe it's the, even the most important thing in life to learn how to master. Like if you can master empathy, there is pretty much nothing that you can't do because it's such a crucial part with, with relationships with other people. And still no one really, very few people talk about it. Our parents don't know it. Our teachers don't know it. So like we spent a hundred plus hours just thinking about what is this concept and how do we explain it and how do we practice it? And empathy in short is just how do you feel what another person is feeling? Because if you learn how to do that, the people around you will feel so understood and so like close to you. Like there is people who will, will love you and want to be around you and you will be able to like collaborate and understand each other in a way that very few people can. And it's pretty simple. So like the podcast is the la last episode is just explaining that concept, explaining how you can learn the skill of empathy, how you can apply it in your life, how empathy feels because very few people can explain what does empathy feel like? What is empathy? Like people don't know this. And at the end of the day, I think it's, yeah, one of the absolute most important skills to learn in life, if not the most important skill to learn in life. And still very few people know anything about it. So our podcast is basically about figuring out what are these kinds of different topics that I wish that we would have learned in school. And then just learning a lot more about them and how to communicate them. So it's partly empathy, partly like networking. How do you meet people? How do you find people that are inspiring? How do you get a mentor? How do you get more energy? How do you stay more focused? How do you, what are feelings and how do you learn from your feelings? How do you control your feelings? How do you make your feelings feel better? Like all of these different things. So it's a ton of different topics that we have just put hundreds of hours into understanding and then communicating them in a few hours. So we're super prepared for each episode. Everything is really structured. We're aiming to give the listener the most value per minute of any podcast out there. Like we never tell a story who doesn't have a point. It seems very spontaneous what we're doing, but it's really not. Like it's super well thought out because I believe that that's too many podcasts just ramble on and too many podcasts are not prepared at all. And we want to be hyper prepared. So that's, that's the story of our podcast. Thank you so much, my friend. And, yeah, I know, I know both of you, uh, you and Emil, you put tons of hours, e even into the preparation of your podcast. And like you said, three-hour episode. Like, I don't even think I've ever heard of a three-hour episode on a podcast before. So <laughs> it just goes to show that you absolutely love what you're speaking about. And there's a message that you want to get across to other people to learn and take a lot of value because I know how much, like I say, effort and time that you spend 
putting into your podcast as well. And if anyone hasn't listened, you need to go and visit a great Becoming Great um, podcast, which is an amazing podcast. And I've listened to many of the episodes and they're so value packed and you can learn so much from them. So empathy, um, it just made me think of the book that you recommended me, Eric, when we first met. So when we first met back years ago, um, I asked you, I think, for your top three book recommendations, but your number one book, I believe, it could be different now, but I believe your number one book was How to Win Friends and Influence People. And that book there taught me a lot about different things in life. And for anyone listening who hasn't read that book, I believe that is such a great book just to get communication skills and to understand people as well, to listen to people, to to be able to hold a space to to hear what people are saying. So I don't know if you want to talk to us a little bit about that book, Eric, that you recommended me all those years ago. Yes, yeah, so I think that's a great beginner's book into understanding human relations, like very small things and behaviors that I realized that I had a lot of behaviors that was working against me before I read that book. And there was just easy things to change and just became a more, become a more pleasant pe- person to be around and just understanding social relationships in a much better way. And it's like, almost a hundred year old book by now, but it's still like humans haven't changed much in the last uh, hundred years. So I think that that's, if, if you haven't read that book, that's a book to read because it will simplify relationships and will help you understand other people. And everything is about like relationships. So basically how to win friends and influence people would teach you how to create relationships with anyone you meet. And then there's a book called Nonviolent Communication, which is even better, but it's more about how do you take those relationships and turn them into deep and meaningful relationships that really matter? How do you become a person who, who really matters in other people's lives? And how do you turn the people around you into people that you genuinely care about and understand and want to know more about? Like that's how to win friends will be like book number one in terms of progression it's the easiest part and the good place to start and nonviolent communication by an author named marshall rosenberg will take you to the depth of like actually speaking to someone's soul and understanding them and having other people speaking to your soul and like being able to talk about all the different things in life that are usually very scary to touch upon uh, but turning them into something that's just profound and meaningful I believe the third book was Factfulness. Yeah, so Factfulness is it's a completely different type of book. But yeah, I've recommended that one to a lot of people as well. Uh, it's by Hans Rosling, a Swedish author, uh, who's unfortunately passed away. But it's about just understanding the world and how the world moves and how many positive things going on in the world that the news never speak about. So it's a great book to get an understanding of what does the world look like? Well, how do things progress? What's happening everywhere in the world and all the beauty in the world? That's also a great book to read. I think we, 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 we both got dogs. <laughs> we both got dogs. <laughs> right, so Eric, as we're sort of wrapping this up now, if it's okay with you, I'd like to ask you five questions and get some answers from these questions that I'm going to ask you. Go for it. Okay, so question number one would be, what is the best piece of advice that you have ever received and why I'm not sure if it's the best I ever received but a very good advice is just learn how to listen like when you learn how to listen to other people and you become a good listener that's just a complete game changer in life because very few people are good listeners and it's actually pretty easy to become a good listener so learn how to be a good listener and it will change everything about your life. Yes, I think that's so important um, because like, for me personally, I love to speak. But you know, even more, just from meeting you and the male, I love to listen even more because you can learn so much and you can, if you need answers from somebody, if you just listen to them close enough, you'll receive all the answers that you're ever hoping for. And I never knew what the, the thing active listening was before I met Emel. And you guys invited me to do some work for you guys. 
um, with great dot com talks with with the YouTube. Here's my son. Oh my god, here he is. <laughs> Hey, Tom. You want to say hi? Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> oh, amazing. He's so cool. That's my, that's my son. He He's runs so cool. straight into a sign. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, Eric, I, I was just saying that. I, I never knew what active listening was before I met you guys. Um, yeah. But, but ML, amazing ta- skill. He, he taught me active listening and the art of listening is a skill that could take years for people to master, if ever to master. So, yeah, if, But you get good at it, it goes quickly. That's just to decide I'm going to be a good listener and actually stick to that. So to master it is really complicated, but to get good at it is pretty easy. But most people never even consider, am I a good listener or do I want to be a good listener? Because they've never considered that a concept. I never considered it a concept. I never even thought of it am I good or bad at listening until I was like 28 years old like before that I've never even considered there was such a thing as a good listener mm. very interesting so the next question on the flip side of that would be what is the worst piece of advice that you ever received Re- let me say that again my throat just went what is the worst piece of advice that you have ever received and acted on and what was the result <laughs> That's an interesting question. Um, I don't know. Nothing really comes to mind. Like worst piece that every of advice I've actually taken and acted on. Um, a really bad advice that I've given people, <laughs> if we flip this around, um, uh, is to uh, don't ask questions you don't want to know the answer to. Uh, like that's advice that I've given to my girlfriend early on in our relationship and she was jealous about things. Like don't ask questions you don't want to answer to it. I think that's a really shitty advice to give because I think it's, it's a horrible idea to try and protect yourself from whatever is actually going on and trying to avoid the painful truths that are in life. So ask the painful questions is a much, much better advice than telling someone to not ask a question because they're not sure they actually want to hear the answer. So I'll just go with that then. That's a really shitty advice that I've given people is to not ask the questions you don't want to hear the answer to because do ask the questions you don't want to hear the answer to. It will make your life significantly more painful, but significantly better in the long run. Wow, that's super important again. And yeah, it's amazing. It's great to ask those questions. Like you say, they will hurt in the short term, but in the long run, it's going to be so, so much better for you. So no, thank you for that. And that was like a a, a script flip there. Like we flipped the script and <laughs> changed the question up. So thank you, Eric. Um, so now I want to ask you the question, because growing up and as you're growing older and as you're improving yourself, you need to learn more. But I believe a big important part of life is to unlearn the shit that we sort of learn as we're growing up through those childhood years. So what was the maybe one or two things that you had to really unlearn growing up through your childhood programming um, into, say, the person that you are today? What did you have to unlearn? So something that I've had to unlearn, and I think that it's very common that people learn is to not trying to build myself up. And what I mean with that is like, don't try to show yourself off. I think almost everyone does. I think people do one or two things. Either they push themselves down or they lift themselves up. Very few people communicate themselves in their genuine matter for better or for worse. Uh, Like either they apologize for everything and they step on themselves and they try to take as little space as possible 
or they go the complete opposite round and they try to show how smart they are and they're trying to like show everything good they're doing and everything good they're actually not doing. Uh, very few people go in some kind of genuine middle ground. And I used to be uh, trying to show everything that I did as well as possible. And I think that most people around me did that. And that's a behavior that I've had to first and foremost be, become aware of and then unlearn that because it's just to get so much further with like the real and authentic version of yourself and what is considered to be like weakness or what's considered to be like the bad parts about ourselves are usually the things that people admire the most. Uh, so like I used to think of saying I'm sorry to be like a weakness because you admit that you did something wrong and you showed people that you are uh that you, yeah you were not as strong as you could have been or you were not right or whatever and today i'm like i'm not i'm not ashamed of of the failures that i've had or like when i've treated someone badly i'm not ashamed of treating them badly i'm proud of saying i'm sorry and fixing it like it's a big difference like I used to be ashamed of if I had treated someone badly, so I didn't admit that I had, because as long as you didn't admit to treating someone badly, it's not really your fault, or at least you can pretend it's not. But now, like, when I've treated someone badly, I'm proud of it because I fix it and I own up to that mistake. And it's a big difference, like, being proud of fixing the problems rather than being ashamed of causing the problem. Yeah, that's, that's so... Awesome. So no, that's so important because it's about having that awareness because awareness gives you choices and choices give you freedom. And if you're not aware of that thing that you have maybe done to somebody, you can't then th fix it because we always think that avoiding, say, approaching that person that we may have hurt, for instance, let's use that right now. So, yeah, we could have hurt someone in a relationship. And we just think if we just avoid it and don't say anything, that everything's going to be okay. But the power lies within having the awareness of what you may have done to that person and then just saying, look, I'm genuinely sorry because I've realized what I've done. And that makes you better as a person. And it's about being vulnerable as well. Like vulnerability, I think, is very important. And... And this is in all areas of life. Like how, how important vulnerability is. I don't, what's your opinions on that, Eric? Yeah, I think that's main, my main point from what I just said. It's like vulnerability is everything. Like if you don't... Like if you don't feel... Like if you're watching a movie and the hero of the movie never shows any emotion so you don't really feel what the hero wants, you're not going to care about the, the hero. So that's like vulnerability is the same thing. Like if you don't really know what someone else is feeling, you're not going to care about them. It's when we know of other people's struggles and the, what they really want in life and what they really don't want in life. That's like when we can feel for them. So we need vulnerability and honesty and just sharing whatever we believe are shameful and whatever we're afraid of and whatever goes on. That's where like deep, meaningful connection happens. You know, I say vulnerability is like a superpower because there's so much strength within vulnerability. And when you can become vulnerable, I believe is when the true healing happens. Because not only do you begin to heal yourself even more, but by opening your heart and sharing your light with the world, it also allows other people the permission to do the same. And that light that's coming from you by opening yourself up is then used to help and guide that individual out of the dark place that they're currently in. So I believe vulnerability is so, so good for the world. Like the more people that can become vulnerable and show their true, genuine, authentic self, the more that we can help each other. So thank you, Eric, for sharing that one with us. So the next question that I'd like to ask is, what is the greatest lesson that you learned from your most painful life experience?
I think the lesson that I'm learning over and over ties back to what you just said about vulnerability and it's like how much life is within vulnerability and like it's when you're going through something really painful and you're actually describing that pain to to someone else rather than hiding that pain and you hold that truth and you're also willing to hurt other people like it comes back to like we try most of us and including myself have lived my life trying to avoid hurting other people but it usually goes on the expense of hurting ourselves, like especially in relationships, especially in love relationships, we do everything to protect each other. And it ends up with like bitterness and resentment and, and everything around it. But a relationship is about hurting each other, but also about helping each other to heal. And I think that's a crucial part about the, the pain I've been going through in my life has often been trying to protect someone else. And then I'm causing myself pain rather than, being okay with hurting someone else with whatever the uncomfortable truth is and then making sure I help that person heal from whatever wound I've, I'm a part of creating. And I see this a lot in like my relationship with Johanna, my fiance, we've been together for 12 years that for the first seven years, I tried to protect her from everything, which just doesn't work. Like we, we end up doing a lot of things we don't want to do. And we're, passively aggressively hurting instead and we're hurting ourselves and today i never try to protect her like i i hurt her a lot but every time i do i make sure to spend a lot of time and energy into helping her heal and recover from that and i think that's the insight of it's much more important to help other people to heal than it is to avoid hurting other people that's like a huge insight that i'm carrying with myself i I more or less never try to avoid hurting someone if if that's the truth. Like I never keep the truth away from someone just to protect their feelings. I always tell them the truth, or I try to always tell them the truth. Uh, if there are people close to me and it's like, it's a relationship that I really cherish, uh, but I'll make sure to spend a significant amount of energy in helping them heal from that. Mm, I'm, I've never heard anyone sort of uh, put it the way that you put it across there, Eric. So thank you so much. And yeah, I mean, for instance, let's say about relationships. Like, I've been there myself. Like, we go through relationships, try never to hurt that person. We just want to make them happy, like we say. But by avoiding the potential pain that you could cause somebody, momentarily pain, you're actually hurting yourself even more than before. And then I do believe like by not doing what you want to do to avoid potential pain to someone else, you're going to resent them and it's going to make that relationship a lot worse. So I just want to say thank you for putting it across that way because I've never heard anyone say it like that. So that's brilliant. So I want to go on to now, Eric, the final question, which would be... Yeah, let's go with the last one because i got some things to do. <laughs> of course, thank you so much. So yeah, the last one would be... <laughs> Knowing what you know now, what one piece of advice would you give to your younger self? I'm not sure if I would give myself any advice. And I think I learned all the lessons when I needed to learn them. Um, life has been difficult, but I think it's thanks to the fact that I didn't know the answers, that I did the mistakes that I did that made me really learn the things that I needed to learn. Uh, so I, I'm not sure if I would tell myself anything, even if I could. Um, I think I, I've been through a lot of pain in various ways and pain that could have been avoided, but I think in all of that pain were lessons. Um, to one extent or another. Uh, and I think I needed to feel that pain and pain is a part of life. Yeah, that's absolutely brilliant. And I made a quote and it says, sometimes your most profound periods of pain can also turn out to be your greatest gifts of growth. So yeah. I love what you said about you wouldn't tell your younger self anything because he needed to experience that momentarily pain to then be able to learn and evolve and grow into the better version 
which you are now. So Eric, thank you so much for coming on today. I just want to say I really appreciate you for getting this done with me and we made it work. So thank you. Thank you for <laughs> thank everybody you for, for having coming me, on. Yeah, so Eric, you. just before we um, close this down now, if anyone wants to reach out to you and follow your journey, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, go listen to the becominggreat.com podcast. That's by far the most valuable thing I've ever created. Eric, thank you so much, my friend. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day there with your beautiful family. I hope your hand heals very quick. And <laughs> I look forward to speaking to you soon, my friend. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for coming on. Cheers. Bye-bye.